welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon when you are turning tuning in. Excuse me. This is Run It Back, episode number 61. I am your host, Menelik Fernandez. This is a bit of a special one for me. For those of you who don't know, uh, so we're actually recording Friday, June 25th. This will get published uh, in July. But uh, Run It Back actually began on June 26th of 2020. So this is the one-year episode. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to celebrate that. Uh, it's been a remarkable experience. Thank you to everybody who has shared, participated, et cetera. Premise of Run It Back remains exactly the same in that we take a game that has happened previously and we run it back, so to speak, where we talk about uh, preparation, we talk about in-game adjustments, we talk about the scouting process, matchups, et cetera. Uh, and then we go through and we, we look at a little bit of film and see you know, how would we do things differently or what we, we would, wow, what we would keep the same, forgive me. Uh, and in most of these episodes, we've been very fortunate to have a coach from the game join us. So the game we're going to do today is our first NBA game on Run It Back. It's the Phoenix Suns versus the Los Angeles Lakers from March 2nd of 2019. We're going to take it on from Phoenix perspective. And we're very fortunate to have one of the uh, assistant coaches from the Phoenix Suns of that year join us, Coach Cody Topper. Cody, if you give me a second, I'm going to try to do you some justice with a warm intro here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Cody is currently the assistant coach at uh, the University of Memphis. He's been there since June of 2019. Uh, he spent a couple of years in the Suns organization as the director of player development and an assistant coach, uh, along with being the head coach of the Northern Arizona Suns for one season. Uh, he was the assistant coach at the RGV Vipers. He, was, uh, he has been the lead trainer and CEO of Topper Basketball for two years a pro staff trainer with uh, Gannon Baker's basketball for three years. Uh, and then Cody had an excellent playing career himself. So I'm going to touch on it really briefly. He played pro in Spain, Italy, UK, uh, Germany, Portugal, New Zealand, uh, Albuquerque, and Montana after having a great career at Cornell University. So Cody, thank you so much. I know you're on the recruiting trail. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Absolutely. My pleasure. Glad to be here and excited to dive in. Awesome. Love it. So take us back. We're going back to 2019. Some really brief highlights of this game. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this was actually the game that LeBron James passed Kobe Bryant on the all-time scoring list. And this is also the game that the Phoenix Suns knocked the Los Angeles Lakers out of playoff contention for that particular year. Uh, you guys played the night before versus the New Orleans Pelicans. So take me through your preparation process. Uh, you know, do you lend more weight to the three games that you had played them earlier in the season? When do you start the scout? All that fun stuff, please. Yeah, so, um, you know, my process starts first and foremost uh, with the five previous games from that, from that team, right? So I'd watch their five previous games, uh, as well as any games that we had played them. Now, if our game was within that five previous, a lot of times I'll go one further back and watch six, right? So right. if we played them at any point in time within those five previous games, um, you know, my, my scouting, um, I guess, philosophy, if that's my, my computer, let me try to silence these, um, is more centered around segmenting the offense and the defense. And a lot of people have a different way of going about things, but what I like to do is pull all the offensive clips. I want, I want to watch all the offense at one particular time. And then I want to watch all of the defense at one particular point in time. Because what I'm trying to do is identify patterns, but the repeatable right. patterns are the ones that you really want to dial into. Um, that's why the five most recent games are, are really telling. And that's also why from an offensive perspective, as a coach, I like to try to mix up my ATO packages because if I haven't, if there's a play that I've run low volume, if not at all in the last five games, I know it's most likely not been scouted, right? So really what you're able to pick up through the scouting process are going to be the high volume actions, the high volume philosophies, uh, as well as understanding kind of where this team's bread and butter is. So dialed in on, on the last five, uh, watch all of the offensive clips from those games and plus our, our previous games um, and then the defense uh, after, afterwards. I like that you do like the chunking method of offense, defense. I've not heard very many people do that. So when you zero in on patterns, what are you then creating for your staff and what are you then creating for your players and how does that get presented to each? Yeah, so, uh, you know, basically I'm separating it um, on 
the three levels, three levels of the shot clock, right? So uh, essentially it's going to be like early offense, right? Transition offense, maybe some teams it's make miss related, right? So they were going to run certain stuff in certain alignments off missed shots versus made shots. Um, and so then after that initial thrust, that early offense is, has been killed and they flow into their half court offense. And it's going to be uh, first and foremost alignment based and then wrinkle based after that. So what general alignments are they, are they flowing into uh, in terms of, you know, where's the five, is it a big ahead, big behind, is it a five out spacing, you know, where are they putting their chess pieces on the board, so to speak. Uh, and then after that, it's, you know, out. what are they looking for? Right. Is it is it off ball screens, on ball screens? Uh, is it heavy dribble handoff? Um, and then, you know, going going from that element, now we can kind of identify, like, what's the DNA of this team? And once we know what the DNA of that team is, then it becomes, well, hey, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Uh, and then, you know, I, I usually identify the three levels of danger. Right. So most dangerous being let's take that away, most likely. Right. And then it goes on that varying degree. Can we take away their three primary options on a given play or their three primary options personnel wise, force them into a fourth option and then hopefully give us a better chance to get a stop on uh, on any respective possession. Love it. So would you be responsible for all of the Lakers scouts for that whole year? Yes. So the Lakers would be my team. Uh, and in addition to that, though, uh, our scouts were separated uh, by. Uh oh, lost it a little bit. All right, so we had some technical difficulties there. Cody, where we were talking, if I'm not mistaken, was about the process of you delivering your scout. And I had asked you if all of the previous LA scouts were yours, and you said yes, you were elaborating on that a little, little bit. Uh, and then my follow-up question was going to be just basically uh, do the length of your scouts in terms of what you deliver to your staff and to your players shorten, you know, the second, the third, the fourth time that you see LA throughout the year? Yeah, I think um, obviously, you know, you become familiar with the opponent, but at the NBA level too, you're, you're pretty familiar with the guys there as it is, right? As long as you're not a rookie, you've played against them plenty of times. So, um, what I try to do is maintain the format, keep it the same, keep it the same length, right? Uh, basketball players are routine-based creatures. So when you find like a comfort zone, something that, that works, right? When, you're, when you when you found something that works for your team, then you just kind of stick with it. Uh, you don't want to just suddenly change things up. Now, if you're, if you're not finding success with, with whatever you're doing, then perhaps it makes sense to, to, to change things up. But um, as it stands, you know, my thought is, keep the same format, the same delivery, the same order, um, and allow the guys to kind of find their groove. So that way, hopefully their, their mind is operating at its highest point and so is their body. Love it. So can you elaborate a little bit as to what that point is for you in terms of what you're delivering? Like how long that scout is? Do they actually still get a paper copy? Uh, the, the film that they're watching, how long those edits are and what they focus on, those kinds of things? Yeah, so this here, here's my routine. I'm, I make a 20 minute advance edit and I would give that to the head coach. Uh, head coach has a 20 minute advance, advance edit. That uh, edit is separated by uh, transition, post up, pick and roll, handoff DHO, uh, screening, and then what we call special teams or in, you know, end of game stuff, right? Crunch time stuff. Right. Uh, from there, uh, I will identify usually the opponent's top three to five sets or alignments and uh those would be our our walkthrough or our dial in actions right high volume stuff right, right. now what we're going to do is we're going to lock in on this being a, a a big key to what we're what we're looking at but my experience as far as the players retention is uh really you can choose the player you, you can have the players uh, retain three things or excuse me two of three things and you can really almost only pick which two you want them to retain they're either going to retain our coverages and our principles, like our base coverages, right? They're going to retain the opponent's personnel or they're going to retain the opponent's plays and alignments. So out of those three, which two would you like your team to retain? I think our coverages is, is near the top for me. 
What about yep. for you? Uh, and then I probably personnel and traits would be the, the next one for me. So that means that the actual sets would be last because really what you're looking to is to defend a concept in a part of the floor, right? Right. We're going to defend a pick and roll on the side. We're going to defend it, defend it in the middle. We're going to defend it in the slot, right? We're going to defend, you know, whatever it is, we're going to defend these various actions. So it's more important to know what we want. Uh, and then the last element is, you know, a game plan adjustment based on personnel. So a personnel adjustment. So knowing what the person you're guarding does is the second most important thing. It's not knowing that the Lakers are running, you know, UCLA down hammer twist. Like that's not the, that's not the important thing. Our guys aren't going to retain that. Like you said, we just played the Pelicans that night. You know, I think I want to say that this was a couple nights before double check that because we played LA and Milwaukee on a back to back and we won both of those games. Maybe there was a day in between the Milwaukee game, but essentially uh, there might, yeah, it might've been. So it was Pelicans, Lakers one day off and then Milwaukee. Is that what it was? Uh, I definitely had to as Pelicans the night before. I don't have the NBA. Next? Yeah, um, I got the schedule because we played the Bucks after that, and the same strategy we used in this game worked against the Bucks. But either way, the guys aren't going to re uh, retain like the name of the, the different plays, and the games come so quickly, so it becomes more about our coverages and personnel being the main things. General so alignments are helpful. I'm sorry to cut you off, then, buddy. I got there, but I got there late. Pelicans the night before, then two days after you play the Bucks. So you're you're right on farther. Yep. So, um, yeah. So that uh, and it, when it comes to number of clips, for their like three or four main alignments and main actions, uh, we're going to show like maybe three or so clips for each of their top, you know, seven or eight players. We're going to get three to five clips in a personnel element. The whole thing is we want to try to fit the personnel into five minutes. We're going to try to fit the team scout into five minutes of video. We don't want to run over that and we want to do minimal stoppages where we can, because other than you're going to tune your guys out. Our guys do not receive uh, at the University of Memphis or before that paper scout. What they will receive is an advanced personnel edit sent to their phone, an advanced team edit sent to their phone as well. So now they can dial in and they can watch whatever they'd like to watch outside of what we're doing. It's available to them. Uh, right. Like if I'm Mikhail Bridges and I've got to guard Damian Lillard. Right. I'm going to send him, uh, you know, a 15 minute personnel edit only on Damian Lillard. So on the plane ride back from wherever we're going, if we're on the plane ride out to Portland, he wants to dial in. He can load it up on his phone, his iPad or whatever, and he can dial in on Damian Lillard tendencies. But is that that's kind of like an opt in basis? Like if he chooses to be doing that, that's in addition. to Yeah, that's a that's a exactly that is a uh, entirely. Uh, uh, decision that he that he makes it's an optional activity right but it's available for the guys what uh what about uh, accounting for learning styles like if some guys are better with walkthroughs or some guys are like would they ever come to you and say like cody i really can't learn this way i need something different is does that happen at all and how do you guys account for that yeah i mean different players learn different ways what we use is the lucio platform obviously to uh to help our guys teach to teach our guys and to help our guys retain both our stuff and the opponent's stuff. The opponent scout is always put into Lucio. Uh, and then you can always go on and they can do memory games based upon their actions. Uh, you can even do memory games based upon personnel tendencies, right? You know, as a guy, is it, is it, is it, is he a right-hand driver, left-hand driver, uh, shooter off the bounce, shooter off the catch, you know, does he get to the free throw line? Does he not? What's his shot profile rim intermediate three. Um, you know, so our guys have access to all that stuff. And the answer is yes. Uh, but what we try to do with the whole process, the scouting process is hit them with these various elements, hit them with the personnel video, hit them with the team video. We we'll always do a walkthrough. We'll do an offensive uh, and defensive breakdown during the shoot around as well. So the walkthrough will review the alignments and the plays that we think are going to be key for the game, uh, as well as some of the personnel adjustments, right? The game plan adjustments based on my, Hey, Steph Curry, we're going to guard him differently. And then, uh, during the shoot around offense defense breakdown we'll usually send one uh you know one group to one side of the floor one group to the other side of the floor review our offensive package for that night uh stuff that uh concepts that we think we can dial in on as well as defense right so if you're playing golden state it's like a big hit the post and run you know curry and clay off the splits right so now you know, we'll just dial in on that how are we guarding those splits so a hundred times a year, if you make playoffs, 82 times a year, if you don't, you guys are getting new information before each game, even on one day turnarounds, uh, you know, like this is our package here for this particular. Yeah. 
it. So back to backs, right? The difference is probably not going to be a shoot around. Back to back will be usually a late walkthrough. So if you played a game, you got on the plane, you flew to the next city, you landed. Guys need to be able to sleep in. So they sleep in. Usually you have a team meeting, uh, you know, around midday after they got some rest. Uh, that team meeting will show film. Uh, and then, you know, we'll go over and, and usually have a walkthrough at the arena or something of that nature. If it's a home game, it'll just be like meet at the arena at three o'clock. We'll do our walkthrough there. I'll watch the film there. And then we'll, uh, we'll proceed with our pregame activities. Are there very many audibles on the defensive side as well? Uh, and, and I mean, basically, like you guys have base coverages or whatever. When you're throwing in things, do you spend a lot of time in that walkthrough going through the, like, we're going to guard this one particular player this way. And you'll spend an extra five, 10 minutes just on that for the one or two people that would guard him. Oh yeah. Uh, for like Steph Curry's for, you know, the LeBron James's for those guys. Absolutely. They get their, you know, their and rightfully so, you know, they're a big part of whether or not you were going to win or lose the game. Right. How you defend them. Right. What, I mean, depending on your strategy, you're going to be let LeBron go to work and guard everybody else or shut him down and, you know, you know, see what happens with the role players that goes back to your philosophies on most dangerous. And if you want to take it away or if you want to make them go high volume to one guy and shut everyone else down, you know, that's that can be a game by game deal or a philosophical question. So um, the answer to that is yes, because if you go out on on the, on the floor against, you know, Steph Curry and, and you haven't dialed in on some type of game plan adjustment, you guard him like an average Joe, you know, you're going to get destroyed. Uh, as much as you're willing to share, let's let's use the specific example of LeBron James in this game. You guys chose to put DeAndre Aiden on him, which I thought was an interesting adjustment. You mentioned it to me when I saw you last week that you had done it as well. Uh, you know, what are what are the things that you're telling him? A couple key concepts or a couple key things to make where it's like, hey, do this, do that type deal, because usually he's going to guard a, a center. Yeah, exactly. So uh, a couple of things. Number one is. What we found, and, and I don't mind diving into this, is that, you know, when LeBron handles the ball in the pick and roll, you know, he shoots just 38.7% on the effective, right? So that's not great. And that's from the right. left, 35.7 effective from the right wing. Uh, he also, when he's handling the pick and roll, finishes 71.4% at the rim. So he wants to get downhill. Obviously, we want to force him into intermediate jump shots. That's what we want to do. So we've got to talk with uh, DeAndre about how now as a five to handle a ball screen. But what we were hoping is with him being defended, LeBron's going to identify that as what he thinks to be a mismatch. So now he's not going to call for a ball screen and switch it small onto him. He's just right. going to try to pull back and attack. In which case we need DeAndre to understand driving scenarios, right? Is he a live dribble driver? Is he better left or right? And he's better left, right? When he goes left, what does he settle for? Uh, so what can you look out for that, right? Uh, LeBron loves to shoot going left. He's better going left in pretty right. much everything that he does. So we wanted him to be able to really know what LeBron's trying to get to, take take that away, force him to a counter, contest, and then box out. Um, you know, obviously, LeBron is also used as a screener at times, so we had, he had to be notified on when that was going to happen. I uh, guarding him in the post. We talked about spots. We want to keep him off the left block. I'll push out the catch where we can if it's a deep catch get in front so yeah we've got to dial in on some of these details and and have deandre understand what are we trying to force like what do we want to give up versus what do we want to take away you know don't take away something we're trying to give up uh, because we're doing that on purpose right right uh okay so i i got three more before i dive into some film uh i know you're in a bit of a rush so i'm trying to speed it up a little bit here for you in terms of in-game adjustments how long or what are the cues that you look for to go away from or modify a game plan where you're like this is just probably not working at this point uh and like you know how long will you stick with the game plan as opposed to making that judgment call that it's not working like what is the margin of error for that's probably just a an anomaly versus this game plan's not overall working yeah i mean that's a great point i think the, the big thing about the NBA is that most of it comes out in the wash. So you don't want to overreact early in the game. Right. Because what you see in a lot of these games that we're watching now is, right, you can get up by 15 or 20 early. And now all of a sudden we've got a tie game at the end of the game. And it's not because teams are abandoning their, uh, you know, their coverages or abandoning, 
you know, the scouting report. No, it's because they're just kind of staying with it and everything is kind of leveling itself out. Right. Um, now, with that being said, you know, as you get towards, you know, crunch time elements per each quarter, right, you've got to dial in and see if an adjustment needs to be made to close a quarter. Uh, if you need to disrupt somebody's rhythm, right, something of that nature as well, dial in on that. And that would go towards kind of a sprinkle. You know, I call it a sprinkle, right? You just sprinkle it on top. Are we going to throw in a possession or two of zone? You're seeing that more and more at the NBA level now, right? Uh, are we going to uh, blitz a pick and roll end of quarter? Are we going to try to take away their two for one? What's our two for one strategy coming back? So those are some of the questions that you have to ask. But to me, I think a couple of things I don't like to overreact to. I don't like to overreact to post, to the post scores. If a guy scores in the post, because now all of a sudden an overreaction might mean sending double teams. We send bodies there. What are we giving up? Right. Uh, probably giving up a higher value, like an open three off the catch, something like or that. A slash to the basket. Or a rim attempt off a slash to the basket, exactly. So, you know, like Mike D'Antoni says, people say live by the three, die by the three. He says live by the post, die by the post. So just because a guy scored two, even three times consecutive on that, you know, maybe he's taking a touch away from somebody else. Right. Understand. Uh, and then as far as feedback provided to your players like I, I like to ask the question halftime what's being said or whatever so at the half you guys are up by seven uh you know so what kinds of feedback are you providing your players in game at the dead balls that kind of stuff when you see mistakes that they're making or things that are of importance in terms of what you're tracking on the sideline or things that jump out on a box score how do you convey that to players yeah, uh, I mean, luckily for us, instantaneous feedback is available on iPads, right? So I can pull clips in and immediately give feedback. If Devin Booker comes out of the game and they're guarding him a certain way and, and maybe he's not seeing it or missing it, or even if he's had success with it, we'll watch it, dial in on a couple of those clips, kind of like a quarterback right. uh, you know, during a change of possession. Uh, and that works for everybody, whether it's DeAndre and his pick and roll coverage level of the screen, where he's at, what they're looking for, right? So instantaneous feedback, is it's an on, ongoing process. Uh, and then in the timeouts, right, it's to whether or not we're making an adjustment. All right, we're, we've been going over this ball screen. Let's go under it now. Uh, we've been switching this. Let's not switch this because they're attacking it. You know, little things like that. Um, usually the timeouts are going to be structured defense first, offense last. That way you get your ATO stuff put together. And you know that right when you're hitting the court, right, what you're running, the offense is the last thing you talked about. So, um, but that process is ongoing. And at halftime, I mean, you know, when you're up by seven, it's more like, yeah, you know, let's keep it rolling, right? There's no... Um, there's no, there's no panic. There's none of that, you know, you don't need to go in there emotionally. I don't think even at the college high school level, guys go in, it's too much of a raw, raw, you know? Right. But we want to, we want to stay at, at this, this, this even level. We don't want to be emotionally high because we're up and then come out and the first three possessions aren't good. And now we're down emotionally and we don't want to go and we don't want to go in there and, and, and kick our guys you know, if they are down, right, because we need to we need to pump them up as well. So it's like we want to try to get to a even keeled emotional state. Like so if we're down at halftime, man, guys, we got this. Let's not worry. You know, stay the course. Right. Is, is the deal. It's not it doesn't have to be a win one for the Gipper deal. Right. Did I lose them again? Cody, you there? Right. Um, and then, you know. You know, we don't want to go in there and act like we've won the Super Bowl at that point in time because now we've got a false expectation going into the second half. Like it. Uh, and then as far as reviewing your game plan post-game, when, you know, they say hindsight's twenty twenty, do you do anything that's like a post-game edit that would say we were right on the nail with this and we had some execution problems or we were off the mark and we need to adjust for the next time? Like, what does that process look like for you? Immediately after the game, I'm going to break down every game. I do this for every game, whether it's my scout or not. This is just what I do. I'm going to break it down, offense and defense, uh, good offense and needs improvement. Not right. Bad. I don't ever use the word bad. You know that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, good defense and needs improvement. Then it'll be separated by, you know, what's the category? Is it a pick and roll coverage? Is it defensive transition? Is it, you know, a, a decision to pick and roll? Um, and so I try to find themes that are non effort related, more technical related, because the film sessions to me need to be focused on the technical. Now, if you guys aren't having a trouble getting your guys to play hard as a general rule of thumb, yeah, every now and again, you have to have one of those film sessions. But to me, I found that those conversations happening on a private individual level, if it's a specific guy, right, who's being lazy or this or that, right, it's better to have those conversations separate and try to find 
common team themes for the film session. Um, but then also I always write a, a post game summary, offense, defense, shot selection, right? So the analytics element. So, so basically the analytics will be broken down offense, shot selection, defense, shot selection, offense, you know, kind of in general, right. In terms of like what we're running and what's working and not, and then defense, same concept, um, file those away from every game and then always go back and review those before you're going to play that next, not, not just for the next game you play, but the next time you play that oppo opponent as well. Can you give us an example of the offense shot selection? Like, would it just be like, we didn't take very good shots or would it be like, you know, we took too many uh, in the mid range that were contested. Yeah, so, so, play yeah, right? so it's a great question. So basically I'm going to get a, a post game analytics report. This can be like a 10 to 15 page report. Right. It's very dense. And so what I'm trying to do is trying to dumb that down. Right. So when I send this post game, uh, you know, one or two pager to the head coach, he can look at it and just extract the important information. So for instance, from this Lakers game, I'll just read directly from it. Offense, shot selection. Pobs is when it comes to this aspect of the game are us taking fewer mid-range shots, going four for nine against the Lakers, all right? We got to the rim 32 times, but converted just 16 for 50%, well below our season average of 62.8% at the rim. So we got to the rim, but we didn't finish. Right. Struggled from the three-point line, but we did shoot 32 free throws. So we were getting to the rim, we didn't finish, but we also drew contact and got to the free throw line. So now on the defensive side, it's, you know, the opposite, right? We defended above the break threes really well in the previous matchup against LA. They went three for 14. Cool. However, they went seven of nine on corner threes. So we didn't defend those rails. So now we need right. to dial in on, you know, well, why were we not defending corner threes well? What was it? Were we uh, too aggressive at the level of the ball screen? And now they were hitting the roll and we were over rotating our low man and allowing that swing pass to the corner. Like, what was it? Right. If that swing pass went to the corner, were we uh, not quick on an X out? Right. So it's kind of a game of dominoes. And but, for those questions that you just asked on the defensive side, would you find that you would have to go and check the film before you write into the report or you'd have a pretty good idea mentally in terms of. Your I personally at this point would have a great, a good idea mentally, but I always do the analytical uh, breakdown before I do the video breakdown. Okay. So I want to get the numbers. And I want to view the numbers as the numbers. Right. And then I want to go view the video and now I'll know the numbers. And so as I'm tagging it, it'll kind of go hand in hand. Right. Um, you know, uh, for instance, too, just to close, right, we uh, we gave up 52 points in the paint in the first half and finished the game giving up 70 points in the paint. Obviously, that's way too many. So, you know, we need to limit their ability to score points in the paint. Um, and also there's stuff on second chance points. So, uh, okay. yeah. And then from the offensive standpoint, it's going to be dialing on specific looks that we ran and on the defensive side, specific coverages, right? That'll be after the film. Love it. Uh, there's two questions in the chat and then I'll jump into film. Uh, I think we're a little bit ahead in terms of schedule, uh, hoping to keep your time there. Uh, the first one, they're both from Armando and it says, um, do you have any special defensive rules on DHOs or do you consider them the same as ball screens? Yeah. Um, no, yeah. Special coverage, hundred percent for dribble handoffs. No question. Not the same as ball screens, completely separate category. Uh, if you try to guard a DHO like a ball screen and your and your big man is going to hand it off and then your X5 guy jumps jumps out, then you're susceptible to like DHO keeps. So general rule of thumb on dribble handoffs is uh, open and let through or whip. Uh, so into the body, go under the, the handoff. That's like uh, the general base coverage, but it's also right into side. So if you get to the point and it makes logical sense that it's like a way out dribble handoff, or if you're like on the high side of the guy and you can, um, you know, and you, and, and you feel like you can prevent him from coming to the handoff, right? Like if that's the case, then you're probably just going to jam it or you're going to, you're going to blow it up and go over the top, uh, you know, or again, on their way out, you're going to go under. So, you know, but the base coverage is really go under. And then the second question, I believe you answered in your description. So I'm a little bit late getting to the question, but it says, what does game day shoot around entail? Is it simply getting some shots up or is there an element of scouting that is being yeah. addressed? I think you walk kind of through, walk, start with a walkthrough um, on the main stuff, get loose, do your calisthenics, uh, do some shooting stuff to get fired up, maybe a little activation with some defensive transition drills, go right to your offensive and defensive breakdown, go together for some offensive stuff as well. Um, overall, 60 minutes usually is a good time period and then close with getting shots up. Thank you. If anybody else has any questions, please feel free to jump in. If not, I'm going to delve into the video portion here with Cody. 
Uh, let me just move this guy. Yeah, while you're doing that, to also say the, the last element on the scout is substitution patterns, which are crucial, matching up guys, subbing in and out of the games, and understanding what your matchups are going to be uh, with who's in the game. So when you have a certain lineup in the game, who's guarding who? So I'll die on into that. I usually have, you know, basically plan A, plan B, plan C. That's amazing. So thank you for bringing that up. I was kind of skipping it uh, over it in terms of what I sent you, but in terms of that, how much power are you empowered with by uh, Igor when you were an assistant coach in terms of managing that? And does that, is it the same all the way through the season or does it change when it's your scout type deal in terms of? Changes, change, yeah, it changes when it's your scout. Some teams that have the defensive coordinator, you know, maybe the information is relayed through him. Um, but for Igor, when it was my scout, um, you know, he, he, he trusted my eye. And, and so then I was, uh, you know, I was able to, here I am, look at the, I'm the idiot standing up right there, but I, uh, I was able to, you know, make those adjustments. Love it. And uh, Amando put one more in the chat, defensive rules when you're matching up in transition there. Rim ball wall. First things back, you don't have any man in transition. Sprint, sprint back to the rim, build your defense from the paint out. Uh, you know, so you want to you want to do that. That's rim ball. You got to stop the ball. You know, where's your pickup point? Usually, you know, maybe one or two steps past half court. You pick a point. You don't want it to be too early because then guys can get around you uh, in the back court and create advantage break situations. Um, and also, you know, ball also kind of refers to loading to the ball, right? So, uh, and then that goes to the last one: wall. Build a wall, right? Protect the rim. Stop the ball. Build a wall. Everybody load into gaps. Discourage penetration. Early kick aheads. If you can force two, or, force two or more passes to the weak side, then your defense will be set. You really have to defend the first eight seconds of the shot clock. That's how you kill transition. And, and I'm sorry, just to elaborate on that, just because it raises the questions, I apologize. The wall, is it always built the same positionally on the floor? No, and not at all. It's based on where the ball is. Right. Everybody needs to load over, right? The ball's on the left side of the floor. Nobody should be on the right side of the floor. We use the midline as a counterbalance. But then it's just going to be based on our general you know, shell principles, right? We don't want to hug our man. We want to be into those gaps. Right. So, you know, we want to show bodies in front of the ball. It's not you versus your man. It's all five of us versus the ball. The ball scores. And, and always the same person to the rim? Oh, no, no, no. You have no man in transition. So there is no man in transition. It's floodgates are open. Rim. That's all. That's everybody. We're sprinting yeah. back for three yeah. steps, right? Whoever stops the ball, it doesn't have to be, it's, it's not your guy. It's, it's not find my man, find a man, the nearest man, the closest man. So different guy can stop the ball as well. Awesome. Love it. Uh, getting into some film here. So it's the Lakers first play of the game was the first one that I had. Uh, and it starts off with a horn set. Uh, they go what I would call like Chicago action where it's a pin down and the, the top guy has the handoff. So they enter to the right forward and hand it off on the left side and then there's an attack and a kick to the left corner and a jump shot for Bullock uh, off of the flare screen tell me what you think they were trying to establish do you have the set uh, are you happy with the way you defended it all that fun stuff yeah I mean this is still uh the Lakers are still running this this set pretty high volume right here so freeze it right here pause so at this point right here Tyler's the one that's wrong right now we know that we want him, actually, Tyler and, uh, and DeAndre, because we, we know that we want to slide under this dribble handoff. We've got to give that space to get through. So play it a little bit more. Let actually, me know. Apologize. Apologize. Booker, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Yeah, pause it right there, right? So DeAndre's right. DeAndre gapped the first one. We wanted to gap everything with LeBron. Book here is on the ball, so he's attached. He jams, so DeAndre passes under two. But the problem is going to arise right here. Keep it going. Yep. Pause right now on this flare screen. That's got to be a switch. Yeah. So TJ is supposed to get out to the corner. Right. So he just stayed too long type deal. And I think he that he's thinking he's thinking LeBron, LeBron, LeBron. Right. So and unfortunately, lack of communication leads to an open three. I mean, obviously, this game, this is not the way we want to start out the game. Right. Uh, and, and then the game, before that, the game before that, they were seven of nine on corner three. So, you know, now they're, you know, eight for 10. Right. Wow. Uh, this is your first set. Uh, you guys end up punching the ball to Aiton. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think he got a switch on the back screen here from Book. 
no, they fight through, and it's it's Aiden against Guzman on the low block. Is it what you want for the first shot? You're looking to establish and get him going. Talk us through it a little bit. Yeah, so our first play of the game, we always rehearse it at the end of uh, the end of shoot around. Right here, this is going to be our one through cross. Um, so you got Booker setting the pin down there. We get a full ball reversal. We set a cross screen right here as we clear the corner. We didn't get a good screen. And then the back screen. Technically, if the lob is available, we're going to set it. Ubre uh, does not do a great job here on this one of going through. He was supposed to clear the corner a while ago. And, um, and then we were supposed to get a cross screen, which was supposed to cause some help. Uh, regardless here, pretty good job by LeBron staying at the low man position. But once you get that, that as a uh, keep, you can keep it going right here. Keep it going. Now, as they fight through, good pause. That's fine. That's fine. Now, I, I, I'm not, it's not ideal. DeAndre back down fade away because with Kuzma on him, it should be back down, back down layup. So, right. Uh, but we'll take the two points. Yeah. Um, this one was LeBron turning down a three earlier and Aiden kind of helping uh, on something he shouldn't have, in my opinion, if I remember correctly. Um, no, this was the... Yeah, I got it. Switch. Yep. So take that Other back, right? Ball. So here we go. So they run they run the flex action. Let's throw it all the way back to the beginning. They run their flex action. DeAndre does a good job. I mean, DeAndre's a muck guy here. We don't want to get up and, and pressure LeBron too much. DeAndre can stay right there. He doesn't have to go out any further. This is perfect, right? If, if, if uh, LeBron sees this, I'm, I'm pleased with this. He's gapping him enough. We want to bait the jumper. And now right here, right, we have not a whole lot of movement on this on the weak side, but Book should be a 2-9 guy. He's got to be in and out. So play it forward. Empty corner pick and roll. There's a no tag situation. So as they turn the corner right here, right, we get a swipe from Ubre, But DeAndre probably could be two slides over, I guess, to the left, try to get his chest in front. But now at this point right here, LeBron's got a free run on this. So so I, I think my question actually on this one was, are you guys okay with Aiden switching on this wing ball screen on the empty side? Yeah, emergency switch, you always have to switch, right? Because the ball is the most important thing. But now if I'm Tyler Johnson, I need to veer back. I need to go over this screen, and I need to get into LeBron's legs and prevent the pass back. Right. Good contest. He makes a hard shot. Uh, this one is... Wing ball screen, Ingram attacks Josh Jackson. Uh, and then Bullock gets moved into being the help position. So on the attack, you get a pretty good, he might've got away with a goal 10. What do you think about uh, him being the low man on this? That's great. That's great low man support there. And his man stays in the dunk spot here, but the, the Anthony Melton probably could have stepped up and challenged this with verticality a little bit more. Also Josh Jackson, we, you know, we don't need to open up the floodgates on a middle drive. That's not great. Right, DA is not used to being the nail defender. He could swipe three S's of strong side, strong side assistance. Right, basically he could uh, he could stunt swipe and then get back to his man. Stunt swipe stick, but he's kind of he inches out, which isn't great. Uh, we do allow them to get to the rim. It's a good recovery by Josh, but preferably no middle drive. And with the low man being uh, a small, I've heard you speak on the pull the goalie concept a lot. Were you guys? willing to give up more drives because you had Aiden on LeBron and knew that he was going to be pulled out more so? Like, I, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is we identified that stopping LeBron was going to be big. Um, and you look at this lineup that's in here. We don't have a four-man in here. Mikhail Bridges is the four-man. Mikhail Bridges is guarding uh, McGee, right? So McGee, here's their five. So right. he's guarding their, technically their four. So we got to figure out what are we willing to live with. And what we're willing to live with is anything that doesn't include LeBron James. Makes sense to me. Um, it's a JaVel McGee score, if I remember correctly. It was like a four across lineup. You get a UCLA screen. Yeah, this is their UCLA action, UCLA double. And, and, then, they and then you guys just kind of give up the dunk on, on the low side there. Talk to me about that split action. In uh, the I end. mean, there's a, there's, this is a simple double screen. This, this shouldn't have happened. Um, but pause right here, right? So we don't have a good awareness from uh, – from Josh Jackson, probably he's trying to go be, uh, he's defending the first screener. So he should be back to the baseline right here. See man and ball type of thing as the guy goes down. Right. All right. So go back, go back three clicks. You can see where it starts. He just allows his guy to go into top lock position as if he was going to switch this. Right there. Yeah. Right. And uh, regardless, you can see there's a miscommunication because Anthony Melton thinks that he's not switching it. So keep going. 
pause, right? And now he's on the high side. Great pass from LeBron. We need better active hands on the ball, you know, but at the end of the day, again, you know, this, it's, 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 it's a game of really, really small decisions that lead to really, really big outcomes. So in the world of instant feedback, when he comes off, will you play this clip and then be like, hey. Yeah, if we had this clip right here available, I would talk to both uh, DeAnthony Melton and Josh Jackson and say, what, what are we doing here? You know, we're switching one through four, so that should have been a switch. DeAnthony should have been body on, ride him to the screen and pass him off, and then, then he would say to an extent that Josh was in the correct place. Right. Like it. Um. We got DeAndre Aiden on a short roll. And then my question was about the burn cut and what your teaching points are on it, et cetera. So they go two to the ball, aggressive. Yep. You guys hit Aiden at the nail, immediately back cut uh, from the loaded side. And I'm just wondering sort of like when you go, who you go from all the time uh, on, on that burn cut. And then, you know, this ends up being a great finish over McGee yep. at the rim. Two, two to the ball, if you take that back, two to the ball. Uh, get off the ball, right? So teams are aggressive on book. He does a great job of being unselfish and not trying to beat two guys. So this is our diagonal series. Boom, to the ball. He's off. Pause it right here. All right, so from the double side, it doesn't matter if the weak side would be the double side. From the double side, all right, we're going to cut the corner and we're going to fan to the corner. So we want Melton to cut, which he does. Uh, TJ point on this for Josh Jackson. Should be a catch and shoot three if he uh, fans out to the corner uh, quicker, right? Good job by DA. He sees it. He sees that they kind of overreact to the low man uh, who's cutting, and then he kicks it out. So let's play it forward. This should be a catch and shoot three for Josh Jackson. Pause. Josh is not supposed to be there. He should have slid down two more steps and been ready to, to, to knock that shot down. So now we can play it. We still Great get to the baseline, and you know we we attack the closeout. So, are there any situations where you cut the wing guy instead of the corner guy, or is it always the corner guy for you? It's it's always the corner guy, and the reason is if you go back, uh, the guy who's going to stop the ball when two are on the ball is going to be the low man. Pause. So that is what opens up this gap from the corner side. If we cut from the slot right here on this, right, I guess you could theoretically lift your guy up. But we want to put pressure on the rim first with the cut, and that's the nearest cut, anyways. Like it. It's also in the vision of the big man. And, and by the way, the cutter was still open, so I mean, he could hit the mate, the Anthony under the basket. Yeah, I, I thought so as well, actually, he was under the rim there, at, right, right there. Uh, the pulling the goalie concept. This is the comment I was making from the other one. Aiden ends up helping off of LeBron on this. Uh, big guys kind of have that uh, that desire to do so. Uh, so would you speak to him? Is this a bad rotation by him? Ends up with a bad closeout and LeBron ends up finishing. It's a bad closeout, not necessarily a bad rotation because, I mean, for us, if the ball finds LeBron on the perimeter, Right, we should short close that, force that jumper, ideally, especially, you know, second quarter. LeBron usually isn't shooting catch and shoot threes. The so you're okay with him down coming balance. down to help off of the top like this because he, LeBron's not, yeah. Yeah, it's LeBron, right? And it, it's, it's an emergency situation if he thinks we're going to give up a layup. We've got to send bodies to the ball, right? We're not just going to let a guy stay out there on Gilligan's Island. Now, um, you know, I don't I don't know exactly what, what, what uh, Brandon Ingram has done at this point, but – I do know that Brandon Ingram had had successful games against us previously, right? So the game before at LA, Brandon Ingram was on fire. We could hardly stop him. So, you know, I mean, you don't necessarily fault this. Look where LeBron, LeBron is non-participatory on this particular possession right now. Look where he's standing. Yeah. He's just not even participating. Now, he, the ball finds him. Um, but what I would just more teaching point is don't go for that pump fake. Right. Stay down on it. Don't let him go by. All right, perfect. I know that uh, time was a bit of an issue, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up right there. Uh, unless some of the coaches have some uh, some questions for Cody, uh, but it looks like not. So, Cody, thank you so much for your time. And to all of the coaches that have tuned in over the past year and shown support, I really, really appreciate. It keeps me going. I hope you guys still find value in this. Uh, happy one year to run it back, and please tune in next week for episode number 62. Thanks again, Cody.